Well, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's class. We're going to cover the King's Gambit for white and how, more particularly, how to play it for black to get an even game without studying a 500-page book by John Shaw, which covers all chapter, all possible ways. We're going to focus in on just one or two chapters where he talks about declining the gambit. Um, first of all, the, the a King's Gambit is from the Romantic chess period back in the 1800s and before. That was the favorite opening of all the white players. Back then, the players considered it uh, cowardly to get play for a draw. And they thought the wilder the attacking and the more pawns you could sacrifice for the attack, that was being courageous player, like a knight on a battlefield. There was, uh, then uh, there was a guy from Vienna named William Steinitz who became one of the first world champions, the officially recognized world champion. There were others before him. Steinitz started out playing the uh, King's Gambit himself when he was young. He played wild attacking chess because that's what they were playing. And he even invented a version of the King's Gambit named the Steinitz Gambit. And the Steinitz Gambit, if you, you, if you want to torture yourself as white, you play the Steinitz Gambit. The man somehow could win games with it, but it wasn't because of his opening. <laughs> anyway, somewhere along middle age, Steinitz had a conversion. He realized that the gambits, when you play pawn to king, bishop, four, it opens up lines that your opponent can take advantage of and get strong counterattacks against your position. And he realized that you, the more pawn moves you make, you're, you have all these weak squares in your position. And he developed the modern chess theory and wrote books about it. He called his book something like the Mo modern chess theory or something. And it was way back in the 1890s when he wrote that. And uh, so he said, what you should do is not play gambits, but, uh, and he, he analyzed the openings and figured out how you should play against people who did gambit. If you take the pawn, what you do is you don't try to hold on to it forever. You don't weaken your, your position trying to hold the pawn. You look for an opportunity to give it back where you get a counterattack in the center that's really strong because the guy who does a gambit often overextends his position and opens himself up for an attack. So anyway, after Steinitz, and Steinitz started winning all the tournaments and he won all the matches, he played for the World Championship, and the old school gradually died out, new players came in, and they all played Steinitz's method. And the King's Gambit became a thing of the past. There were only a few die-hard romantic chess players that still played it. There was a Russian, he was a little younger than Steinitz, but he, he played against Steinitz in a bunch of tournaments named Chigorin from Russia, and he played the Gambit all the time. And he, his favorite was the Evans Gambit. Anyway, uh, he was f fairly successful. I mean, he was, he was about 50% against Grandmaster, so he won some, lost some. And then after uh, the next generation, hardly anybody played it. And then uh, world champion Alekhine, when he was a young, he was also another Russian. He, he was a great attacking player. He played the King's Gambit in the 20s and 30s occasionally, just as surprise value. And then after him, oh, there was a grandmaster named Tarktikauer from, where was he from, Poland? Yeah, he was Polish. He was Polish. And Tarktikauer liked to play the King's Gambit, and he wrote a book called, he was one of the hypermodern school with Nimzovich Tarktikauer. He wrote a big f book called Hypermodern Chess, and in it, he talks about how good the King's Gambit is for white 
but white should play bishop to king two, not king, queen bishop four. It's called the bishop's, the bishop's gambit. Or the bishop goes to queen, or maybe it was bishop to queen bishop four and not knight to king bishop three. That's how Tark to Coward liked to play. Well, after he uh, went on, then uh, there was hardly anybody until World War II, and some Russians resurrected it. There was a famous Russian after World War II named David Bronstein, Russian-Jewish guy. He was extremely good. He played the world championship match with Mikhail Botvinnik, and he tied Botvinnik, but the rules at the time said a draw, the Botvinnik retained the title. But anyway... Bronstein used to occasionally play the King's Gambit because it was so complicated and he could surprise his Russian opponents. And then after him, world champion Boris Spassky played it when he was a younger man a number of times. But with him, it was more just for diversion to change pace and surprise his opponents. When he became when he was fighting for the world champion, he did not play the King's Gambit against Tigran Petrosian, who was considered the best defensive player in the world. So Spassky held that King's Gambit for lesser players, actually. And after that, that was about it. Bobby Fischer published a refutation of the King's Gambit during his career. Uh, John Shaw says, well, it's not really a refutation, it's an even game. Other people have done refutations, but the, the book that Claudio has, he says, if white plays properly, it's still an even game. So, And if black slips up, then white can get a big advantage. So it's a good surprise value. So anyway, the easiest way to play against it is to decline it, not take that pawn to f4. So here's how... This game is Hanson Lars. Uh, we had to go down in quality with the ratings. Poor Hanson Lars is only 2330. He's only a couple hundred points better than Claudio and myself. And they played in some tournament in 97 called the Tastrup Jubilee. I don't know where it is. He played a guy named Gerard Welling, who's only 2385. But anyway, uh, we're going to use these because the, the really strong grandmasters don't mess with it for the most part. Now, the, the standard move two for white is pawn the king bishop four, as we showed you. This game they get at it in a different way, but it transposes. Move two is knight to c3, and Claudio was talking about the Vienna version of the king's gambit. It starts out like this. It's safer for white. He shores up his center with developing his knight to queen bishop three, protecting his king bond before he goes wild with pawn to king bishop four. So anyway, black, the characteristic move of declining the king's gambit is the bishop move to c5. So, and then uh, white brings out his bishop to queen bishop four. And black develops his knight to f6. And uh, Hansen still is not going to show the king's the gambit yet. He plays pawn to queen three. And black knows f4 is coming, so he just sets up the standard with d6, setting up the pawn chain. Now finally move five. Lars Hansen plays the, the characteristic move, f4, usually played on move two. And this is the decline, and black just developed his knight, reinforcing the e5 pawn and the d4 square. And white gets his bishop out. And now we're at, at the key move for black that I recommend that you play, move six. It's, uh, as you can see, it's a6, and there's two reasons for that move. First of all, it gives an escape square for your black squared bishop. So if white, white might steal your bishop with knight to queen rook four, and this gives you an escape square. But it does something else. If you want to steal white's bishop with knight to a5, he has this little check over here 
pawn here. He comes back here. You can get the bishop, but you've weakened your queenside pawns with those pawn moves. And you can take the bishop, and you just opened up the queen rook file, and I can guarantee you you're not going to castle queenside <laughs> as black. Now, Claudio would say, well, with those advanced pawns, I can get some threats. True, but you would admit there are weak squares in that pawn position if it gets to an ending, for, for example. So anyway, the other purpose of a6 is now at some point black could play knight to queen rook four and take the bishop, and there's no bishop to b5 check. All right. Now, the, the two lines we're going to go through for white, according to John Shaw, there's like five moves for white here. But the two that he recommends, the first one is rook to f1. Because he can open up the f file with f pawn takes e5, and the rook will shoot down toward that f7 pawn and help the bishop on c4. Now, the other move that we'll get into the next game is to advance in the center with knight to d5. Now, you're not supposed to move the same piece twice in the opening. That's an opening rule. But this is an exception because white wants to get the knight up. Then he's going to shove this, his c pawn up to c3 and prevent black from doing the same maneuver with knight to d4. See? And then he can uh, maybe move his queen to king, uh, queen to king two, and his bishop out, and then castle a queen side. So that's one reason why the knight to d5 move is played. And even though it violates the two move rule, it has the good logical purpose behind it. But in this game, we're going to look at rook to, to f1. Now, the move that uh, John Shaw recommends for black is to eliminate white's best attacking bishop, that bishop on c4, by bishop to e6. Now, uh, the problem with, you could take the bishop with knight to queen rook four, like I said, but there you moved your knight twice, and you've neglected developing your bishop you haven't castled yet. So you take the bishop, it's debatable that you've gained anything because you spent moves to do it. But this bishop move eliminates the attacking bishop and develops a piece that was back on c8. So it's more logical. Now he says, yeah, the drawback, you could say, Claudio doesn't like double pawns. <laughs> Chess masters don't like double pawns. Well, I'm guessing. <laughs> But in this case, it's different. Even though they're double pawns, they cover all the key center squares. That pawn on e6 keeps the white knight from d5. You see that? It can't hop into d5. Nor can anything go to f5. The white squared bishop is gone. It's the white squared bishop that would attack the pawn on e6. Also, the double pawns, since they're in the center, they control all the center squares and they're blocked by a white pawn on e4. If that white pawn wasn't there, they would be hopelessly weak because you could pile up rooks on the e-file along with the knights and win those pawns. But the fact that there's a white pawn, that keeps the rooks at bay, and the pawns are quite safe, and you can always bring your queen up to uh, d7, the castle queen side or castle king side, and you can always bring the rook over if you need to support. Anyway, the pawns really aren't weak. And consequently, white does not take the bishop on e6 playing for the double pawns. That's considered uh, not the best approach. OK. You got a question? Go ahead. What, what, what's your question? Wait a minute. Are you talking this position? Now, they usually do pawn takes pawn, because right now, you see how there's a triangle of pawns, the double pawns and the neighboring pawn? That's actually a stronger pawn position. That's why white does pawn takes pawn, 
Now the two pawns are doubled and they're isolated. There are no other pawns around. So this is the weakest they can be. Well, but what, there's nothing attacking it. It's, it's not protected. You don't say hanging just because it's unprotected. And then you can move your knight to a... D, well, there's no reason to move. Oh, black, white can. But the bishop can repeat, retreat in front of the rook. And then the knight can't take it. And the knight would be on the side of the board, which is bad. Right here. Yeah. And I go here. Now what? Oh. Now what are you going to do? You can't move your, your... The best square for your bishop is either e3, and you can't go there because my bishop's on that square, or you can try to pin the knight. But pinning the knight's not effective because I can castle kingside and the rook protects the knight. Or I can play rook to f8. I can move my queen up and I can castle queenside. White has no attack whatsoever. And look, your knight on queen rook four only has four squares he can go to, and two of them are covered by the black bishop. So the knight, and one's covered by the white pawn, the knight has no better move than to go back to c3. You just wasted a move with knight to a4. And black wanted to retreat his bishop. Now his bishop's protected, not Un, not hanging or unprotected. So black's better off for having been chased there and white's knight's out of play on the side of the board. So what about uh, if, uh, before doubling the pawn? Um, Wait a minute. Are we talking about right here? No, before that. Are we talking about here? That's the move. Look at move eight on the board. It says knight to d5. That's the best move for white. You advance. You always advance. You never retreat Why unless you have to. Why not a4? What does a4 do? It is attacking the bishop right now. No, uh, not bishop. The knight. Knight to the bishop. What knight a4? Well, we, we already talked about doing that. The bishop just retreats here. Then the knight's on the side of the board again with nothing to do. All right. Anyway, black wanted to take the white bishop, but he can't take the bishop. The knight's in the way. He can't take the knight with the black knight because then the pawn would take and would attack two black pieces, the bishop on e6 and the knight. The only way to eliminate the knight in the middle of the board, and I, it's on the fifth row. You see the knight's on the fifth row? When you start the game, white has the first four rows and black has the next, right? So as soon as that knight goes in the fifth row, that's like an invading uh, army in your territory. That's like a Mexico army coming into Texas. You want to take them out. So that's what, that's what black does. But he has to take it with the bishop. And if white does bishop takes bishop, the knight takes the bishop, and white gets double pawns. White's pawns have been weakened, and his two best pieces have been eliminated. So he takes with the pawn, and he drives the knight away from c6. Again, the knight doesn't retreat. He doesn't have to retreat. He does the same move you were talking about. He comes into d4, and he's going to trade off that knight on f3, you see, maintaining equality. We're trading pieces. And look, that pawn on d5 for white blocks that bishop. See, that bishop is no longer attacking f7. So you got to say bishop to e6 worked. It neutralized the bishop on c4. Do you see that? The bishop on c4 is attacking nothing now. Right. Well, it's attacking a pawn on a6, but that pawn's protected by a pawn, so he can't ever take that pawn. And he can't, he's no longer attacking the f7 pawn because his, his king pawn is now on d5. That's called a bad bishop. When you have a, your, a bishop behind your own pawn, that's a bad bishop. They don't have good moves in the future. Black is doing fine. 
Best move for white here is to open the E file and black takes Why have nine, six, nine? here. Yeah. Well, it, it, may I say it does nothing? What does black do? What would you do if you were black? Um, you can take it back with the bishop or the pawn. Yes. Which one? Pawn. That's absolutely wrong. Didn't I just tell you that you don't want to block your bishop with your own pawn? Now, if you take with the bishop, you're not blocking the bishop, right? So the right way is this way. And now that black bishop is on d4 is better than the white bishop on c4. You see that? The black bishop is attacking a white pawn on b2 and attacking the squares e3, f2, and g1 all in white's territory. The white bishop is attacking nothing of importance. Black is better. So knight takes knight accomplishes nothing for white. It's a waste of time, and he doesn't play it. Now, he can open up the, the line his rook is on, and he can weaken black's pawn structure with pawn takes pawn. Black has to take back with the pawn. Now notice that that black pawn on e5 is not protected, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you might think so, but look, the, uh, the black can castle kingside and next move bring a rook down and attack the white king. This would be very dangerous for white to take that king pawn. He can't take the king pawn. If he took the king pawn, black would most likely castle. Well, maybe you know, queen e7. Um, okay, okay. I go with queen to e7. Yeah. Because then you don't have queen two. Oh, right. And, uh, and you can castle queenside. You're right. <laughs> queen e7 is better because your knight guards the e2 square, which is. And you're threatening queen takes knight check. How do you defend your knight? Okay, but you have to admit you're defending. White's defending, right? Yeah. White's attacking nothing. White has passive positions. Okay, bishop to d6, threatening bishop takes knight. How do you defend that knight? I think that bishop can give the check. What bishop? We don't need to give the check. The check is bad. Look, 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 look. If I go here, he pushes his pawn up and attacks my knight and bishop, I lose one of them. So the check is no good. But Claudio's move attacks the knight for a second time, and white can't defend it conveniently. The knight would take it. The black knight would take it. So you see, you don't want to take that free pawn, do you? Not anymore. Where are you going to move the king? You can't go to e2. My knight guards that square. You can't go to f2. Well, the bishop is on that line. The knight moves, say, to b3, discover check, and then takes the rook. You can move in front of the king, and that doesn't help you. You block your own bishop. You haven't moved the bishop out yet. Remember, you want to move your minor pieces out. Which minor piece has white not moved yet? Well, don't you think he should move the bishop somewhere? And once you establish that, what square should the bishop go to? And that's exactly what he did. He pinned the black knight to keep it from coming in and attacking white. And now he's going to move his queen up one square and castle queen side. Or he might play pawn the queen bishop three and drive the knight back. Knight takes knight, queen takes knight, and then castle queen side. I think uh, not the black move. The black is going to play uh, h6. Very good. You're not reading this, are you? No. Okay. What does white do now? White would go to 
That's not the recommended move. The recommended move, in fact, in the game, if you look at the game, move 12 is knight takes d4. See how it has a question mark by it? And see the minus over a plus? The minus means the white is the first symbol, the minus, and the plus is the black, the second symbol. That means black has a significant advantage after knight takes knight, bishop takes knight. That's a, a mistake by white. The computer says... Well, there's a number of things black could do. Number one, black could do, he could drive the bishop back, couldn't he? Okay. What's that? Oh. Okay. All right. Now you'd have to move back here, right? You'd move here? Yeah. Well, knight takes knight check. Queen takes knight. Well, wait a minute. Wait, this is not right. This is not right. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. How about plain old queen to king two? Then I'm going to cast the queen side next move. What does white do? All right. I castle. And you castle. Isn't this approximately an even game? All right, let's see what white really did. What the computer... You know, you got a point there, Claudio. All right. All right. Now, we did drive the bishop back, so if need be, we can drive it further, right? Maybe we should play something a little more reasonable. Well, we can't castle. I, if, what would your move be? How about queen to e7? Is that okay? He doesn't like that either, I can tell by his hmm. Oh, you tell me what to do. I like queen to e7. Number one, I can castle. And if he does knight takes knight, I can always do pawn takes knight check or something takes knight. I can do bishop takes. I can, I can live with that double pawn on f6, can't I? I'm counterattacking on the queen side, aren't I? Huh? When, if he takes, all right, let, let's find a better move. Claudio doesn't like queen to king two. How about queen here? How about queen there? Is that better? And then I castle queen side, and if he doubles my pawns, I can put a rook on the G file. I block the pawn, my queen's active, and if he does knight takes, bishop takes, then the queen can come up to b4 and attack the, the white king. Queens, if it white castles queenside, the queen can come in that direction. Yeah, and I'm not on the e-file, so I don't have to worry about any rook coming down at me. You know, we're not going to resort to the computer yet. <laughs> can I show you what the computer says? White should do? Okay. The computer says your white should just take it. Queen takes. White should liquidate. Look, he's on the queen and he just took a piece. Black has an answer. Queen here, check. G3. Queen takes. So he got out of that rather nice, didn't he? Now, though, he, Temple, C3, 
Queen to e3. White has nothing better. Queen takes, king takes, and guess what? Bishops of opposite colors. Pawns are even. White's bishop is bad. This is a dead draw. Do you think you could win this ending for either side? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. The computer says it's a... And John Shaw in his book says it's a dead draw. You can read it later tonight. All right. So, however, remember, our guy is not quite a grandmaster. He makes a mistake here. Knight takes. Why is that a mistake? Doesn't it just transpose? If bishop takes knight, so anyway, it's black's turn. What should black do here, Claudio? That's right, and that secures a significant advantage. The knight comes in. Does that scare us? We just attack the knight. If he goes in there, he's trapped. He can't go to g7 check. He can't get out. He has to retreat. And we just come here and we're going to block the file with bishop to f4. And he's going to have a hard time castling on either side of the board, don't you think? So, who has the advantage now? Black. I told you White's bishop was worthless behind the pawn. White's knight's hardly any better. It's on the third, it's on the G file near the edge of the board. It can't even move into Black's territory because it's blocked by the G6 pawn. It can't go, it could go to E4 and get swapped off, maybe. The the king is stuck in the middle of the board, and the queen doesn't have any really good squares either. Well, the queen could go to f3, but the bishop will block it and prevent queen takes knight, at least for a while. And the black rook is attacking the h2 pawn. So you're not going to have time to, if my bishop goes to f4, you can't move the knight back and hit it with g3 because your rook pawn's going to be gone. The computer says minus over plus. This is a half pawn or more advantage for black. You picked, you picked a question mark move, Claudio, that leads to a loss. You just went from a half pawn down to a dead loss. Now, guess what the refutation is? The bishop to f4 thing, blocking the rook. And if pawn takes pawn, you just do queen takes pawn, and then he's helped you. You can castle queen side, and he opened up the queen file for your rook, right? Well, it looked like you were getting something on the f file, but that bishop to f4 is a good move. All right. Now, white brings his knight in, and black blunders and gives an even game. He does pawn takes pawn. What should black do? Then the footnotes there move 16. He should just grab that silly rook pawn. Now you can't trap the bishop with g3 because black has knight takes knight. And if pawn takes knight, bishop takes pawn check. And if you do pawn takes bishop, uh, there must be something. Oh, you can do knight takes pawn on d6 and attack the bishop. And coincidentally, the knight protects the pawn on f7 too. So black is winning here. But not after this move. Now white does get time for g3, right? Knight takes knight. He's still on the bishop. 
Black has to give up a piece, but he gets enough pawns to hold the game. He counterattacks with queen to bishop six. Naturally, white takes the bishop. Oh, no, white take, taking the bishop is a blunder because queen to bishop six threatens to get the, the white bishop, which is unprotected, with queen to bishop four check. The move for white to hold the draw is queen to d5, protecting the bishop and threatening queen takes pawn check. You pick the bishop up a little bit later. Okay, now, I didn't figure this out. This is the computer. Now, black best move is to castle, giving up the bishop. But look, he gets the b2 pawn. The, the rook can't even protect the c2 pawn. You see that? Rook to d. And then we take the pawn there, and the rook and queen are raking this white second row. The computer says rook to f3, so you can shoot over and threaten rook to b3. But queen just takes the pawn. Now the queen and rook have the second rank. Bishop takes pawn, threatening queen takes pawn, check. Mate. Rook to h1, check. Rook back. Oh, bishop back. And now there's no checkmate because the bishop's away from the b7 pawn. So we can block, win a pawn, and block the f file. And, get, uh, and this peters out to an even game. King over, rook here. Oh, this is cute. King here. Now watch this. Rook check. Queen here. King here. And nothing better than a perpetual check. Well, look at all the pawns that black has. And white's king is not in a safe spot, right? And the white bishop cannot join in any attack. So it's even. White is nothing better than a perpetual check. Which position are you talking about? The one we were just at? Yeah. Let me go back to it. The king has nothing but to go back to b8, you see. Yeah. And the queen just goes back to d8. And the, the, the rule in chess is it's a draw by, perpetual, by always checking the king. And black can't avoid getting checked every move, okay? And if you repeat the position three times, it's a draw. So after three repetitions, it's a draw. Most reasonable chess players would agree to a draw here. Some unreasonable chess players would make you play it out. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. All right. However, white missed the very good move, queen of d5, and made the very bad move, g takes. Black gets the bishop back, and now black, white's pawns are horrible. Two, four, white has six, black has two, four, two, four, six, seven. Black's up one, but he's going to get that uh, white castles. The A2 pawn goes, threatening mate. All right, I'm not going to go any further. It's pointless. He's got two, four, six, seven pawns against four. Three pawn advantage. I believe it's an easily won game. But it, I will admit the d6 pawn is hanging. Oh, he can't take the pawn on d6 because it's uh, queen to a8 check, king up to the second row, rook takes h pawn check. And then the queen and rook combine on the b2 pawn. So the king cannot find safe haven anywhere. And if he takes, if he goes, yeah, so that's, that's about it. If he goes to the third rank, black can play 
rook to h3 check, and then his rook and queen are on the c3 pawn too, right? Well, anyway, anyway, he has at least a perpetual check. So that'll cover it for tonight. Thanks for coming.